and take it away, Tom. Well, hello and welcome to uh, welcome to Tom Talks on Hunting. This is a uh, see here. There we go. Um, and Tom, did you want me to launch the poll now? Yes, why don't you launch the poll now? Um, so we have a, a poll just to get a sense of who our audience is, some of your experiences or lack thereof with hunting. So if you please just uh, quickly uh, take the poll and we'll uh, start to move on. And I'll just give it about a minute here to get the answers. Looks like we've already got 22 people out of 26 responded. So <laughs> I'll be able to share the results once they're all in. All right, we'll give it like 30 more seconds. So if you haven't answered, this is your last chance. All right, I'm gonna close the poll and share our results. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Um, well, I'm glad to see that there are there are both uh, avid hunters and people with relatively little experience. That was really what I was hoping for in this presentation, a, 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 an audience with a variety of different experiences and familiarities with hunting. Um, I'll, I'll, those of you who don't know me, which is maybe most of you, I, I have been an avid hunter since 1964 when my father First took me rabbit hunting in Tennessee. Um, um, I see some hunter orange out there. I started hunting actually before hunter orange. Uh, that came in sometime in the 1970s. I remember going to Sport Mart in Lombard and buying my first acrylic bright orange cap in order to be legal. Um, and that was sometime in my 20s. So um, yeah, I'm, I've been doing this for a long time. On the second, which is which is good in one way and in another way if you've done something for a long time sometimes you don't really stop to think about why you do it you just do it because you've always done it and i've you know i, I remember my father and i remember lots have lots and lots and lots of memories of family and friends and participation in activities in various places and times uh and uh and if you've done something for a long time maybe you don't stop and think about really why you do it or you satisfy yourself with fairly easy explanations and I could have clicked in fact I did click virtually all of them uh, on the second question because they're all benefits that for me uh, benefits that I've achieved through hunting uh, but I want to I'm not sure any of them for me are, are adequate um, answers to why it says your main motivation I, I, I'm not I'm not sure my as an example I would you know Again, most of you don't know me, so I, I have a motorcycle. It's very old when I ride it back and forth to work during the summertime. I try to do it once or twice a week if the weather is good. Um, 
And I could say one of the reasons I do that is because it gets 55 miles of the gallon and my truck gets a whole lot less than that. That's a benefit I get from it. Um, um, and uh, the nostalgic benefits is something I've owned and used for a long time. I have lots of memories of people that I bought it from and I've been riding with and all of those things, but none of them really explains why I do something. It's 28 times more likely to die on a motorcycle for every mile that I am in a car. And none of those things really explain why I do it. Um, and it, I, I think it's quite likely that I don't do it despite the danger, although I, it is partly despite the danger because I wear a helmet and I wear a protective jacket, but it's also because of it because that's just a part of who I am and what I've done in my life. So I wanna, I wanna try to go that one level deeper. These are all really good reasons why many of us hunt and have hunted for a long time. I just wanna, wanna, wanna at least pose the question, can we go a step deeper? I'm gonna try to do that in the presentation. Um, an ecologist's perspective on hunting. Uh, I'm going to ask the question of what is a hunter. I mean, in some ways, it's a very simple question, but I want you to think about it just for a moment now over the next few minutes as I'm talking, and then and then uh, try to ask that question at the end and see if if maybe your answer has changed. If 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 only <laughs> it likely. What is an ecologist's perspective on this? Well, I mean, for me, that role as an ecologist has been primarily a teacher. Um, partly as a scientist, uh, partly in, in, in big ways as a conservationist, but I also have a life as a son of my father. Um, I am a father now. I've been a friend and I'm a friend of people I hunt with. All of those roles in life give me a different perspective on what it means to be a hunter today. Um, and I am a hunter today. So uh, it is it is an ecologist perspective, but it's it, unavoidably, it's perspective of all these other roles I've had in my life. Uh, I think we all have to, realize, both hunters and non-hunters, I think, I think if we're honest with ourselves, realize that hunting makes a lot of people uncomfortable. I mean, I, I know that in many, many, many conversations in life where that topic comes up, I can often feel a slight strain in the conversation, people often wanting to change the topic. Um, I think, you know, a little bit of it at least has to do with the association of hunting and guns and the fact that guns have become part of political divisions in the country. Um, part of it um, has to do with, uh, well, I think the association of hunting with our sort of as a rural pastime and a relic of a sort of historical rural past. And frankly, most of us live in cities today and every generation is another generation separated from life in the country. Um, but I think honestly, this is my estimation and talking with people over the years and feeling their discomfort. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the killing and it's the, in particular, the personal and intentional nature of the killing. You really can't get away from that in hunting. It's, it's that, that is in a sense the climax at least of of what you're doing in hunting. And that I think makes people uncomfortable. Um, but I wanna back up for a minute. This is my life as an ecologist here. As animals, all of us eat the bodies of other living things in order to stay alive. That's, that's, that's what it means to be an animal. Unlike a plant, I can't live by carbon dioxide, water, um, and inorganic nutrients. I have to eat other living things in order to stay alive, meaning I have to kill other living things and eat them. Many of us make distinctions between things we eat, organisms, based on whether or not they have central nervous systems, or, you know, whether they're plants or animals, warm-blooded or cold-blooded animals, or even between birds and mammals. And all those distinctions are, are fine. They're each person's right. Of course, everyone has a right to think about what they put in their mouth and, and, and come up with reasons why they eat what they eat. That's perfectly fine. Yet, yet all the organisms we eat were equally alive. Um, a piece of celery is as alive as I am, or at least it was before it was plucked out of the ground for me to eat. And all of us descend from the same primordial ancestors. I'm never very far away from my life as a scientist from Darwin, who's very 
um, influential and inspirational character in my life as an ecologist. Uh, and uh, ever since 1859, I, I, I think the, the issue has been decided. Um, Darwin says it this way, having been originally created by, breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one, meaning original forms of life. And that whilst this planet has gone cycling according to the fixed laws of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms have, endless forms most beautiful and wonderful have been and are being evolved. So we are related to everything we eat blood related uh, in the sense of, of, of relationships as I'm related to my daughters, I'm related to every other living thing on earth. If you go back in time, you find those, those uh, points of common relation. And it's also about how we eat, what we pay attention and how we pay attention to what we eat. Does our killing and eating resemble a religious ceremony? For instance, if you go to church, the communion is, is an eating, it's a religious ceremony. Does it resemble a factory production floor, just taking something or, or is it accepting a gift? Or is it really, a, as it often is in our society today for me and for many of the rest of you, a casual reply to our appetites forgotten soon afterward? Um, our lives impose costs in the world that are, you know, for the most part hidden from view. In the language of economists, we call those externalized costs Externalized in the case of, of much of what I'm gonna talk about from a moral responsibility, like let's think about just the obvious examples of, of, of cost that our society imposes on the living world, like roadkill and birds flying into windows. Uh, about a million vertebrate animals are killed in vehicle collisions uh, every day. That's That's not a, guilt or shame that any one person has, but it's one that we collectively have. This is a part of our society. Part of being a part of this society is that this is a cost that our society imposes on the world, a part of our lifestyle. Um, hunters, uh, certainly these are not inconsiderable numbers in large numbers, but, but um, a million a day uh, dwarfs the number of animals killed, at least by legal hunting in this country. Um, window collisions, somewhere between 100 million and a billion birds a year collide into windows. Again, none of us intend that to happen. It's completely unintentional, but it's a cost that our society imposes on the living world around us. And we're all a part of imposing that cost, regardless of whether you're a hunter or a non-hunter. Not to mention feeding yourself. If you're not a vegan or a vegetarian, you're part of this cost on the world. Uh, billions of chickens uh, and turkeys and hogs and cattle and rabbits. These are, are uh, another cost our society imposes on the world around us. Again, I'm, what I'm trying to do is to set a, a, a basis for, for how do we understand uh, hunting? What part does it play in our, in our society today? Um, because society does a really good job of isolating us from the unpleasant realities. And my point is that we all wear the mark uh, of the killer. And this should demand from us a certain humility and respect for the natural world, both for hunters and not hunters. We're all a part of this together. Uh, for the last few thousand years, um, up to including the contemporary scene, have taken us farther and farther away from our animality. And I'm going to use that word a number of times, and by that I simply mean our, our life as animals, as, as creatures that have to kill and eat other creatures in order to survive, and our, and our relation of blood and spirit with the natural world. And by blood, I'm really referring to that, that relationship of, of relation, of, of, of descent, and uh, an evolutionary relationship to other things. By spirit, I'm really only referring to I mean, it could, could include religious beliefs, but really about that irrational part of our world, like love and commitment uh, and courage and all of those things that, that populate our life and give us reasons to do things that are not strictly speaking rational. Um, other societies uh, 
preceded us that had ways of thinking about these issues, uh, very profoundly different from the way we think about these issues. Um, we, as a society, I, I believe anyway, as a conservationist and an ecologist who's been studying and working in this field for a long time, we've, we've essentially lost our place in the world. We survive as a society by hovering just above the earth and from which we extract resources and eject waste. Um, and sustainability, which is, is a great thing, it's, a, it's essential for a modern society, has become this sort of abstract economic relationship which really only implies our ability to extract resources and eject waste forever and ever without end. It really doesn't deal with, with what part of that is a part of a moral and ethical relationship to the world around us. Respect, gratitude, and reciprocity. I'm gonna use those words a number of times in this presentation, our personal moral relationships between me, between the people I hunt with, between the, me and the animals I hunt, between me and the land I hunt on. These are personal moral relationships I want to spend much more time talking about today. And whether we desire to participate or not, hunting and the very personal and intentional nature of the killing, I think, gives us a chance to reassess and ground our position in the world. And that's not just for hunters, but for conservationists in general. You don't have to be a hunter to, 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 to uh, to learn from this. Why do we hunt? And since that first or the second question in the survey was a question similar to this, why question? I like why questions because if you're honest with yourself, you almost never get to the bottom of the why, but that's not bad. Uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to keep asking yourself the why question to see how far you can go and how deep you can go in answering that question. And I want to start pretty far, pretty long time ago. This is 17,000 years ago. And I just want to ask the questions. These are hunters. 17,000 years ago, the, the paintings in uh, Lascaux, France, famous for a long time. I first ran into these images when I was, uh, believe it or not, in art school a long time ago, studying history of art. And when these pictures went up on the uh, overhead projector, they were stunning to me. I'd never seen them before, just stunning. And they're still stunning pictures to me in their beauty movement of the animals, just totally enthralling to look at these pictures. You could, you can go on the web and just see more and more and more of them. And I want to ask you why they did this. I mean, we can, we can imagine these were hunter-gatherer peoples, and, and in some sense, they needed to hunt. They wanted that high-quality protein source of meat. They didn't have to do this. I mean, this, these are master works of art. This is all that survives. This is 17,000 years ago. So essentially all of the artistic productions of the culture have been lost, the dance, the storytelling, who knows how much visual and, and uh, creative art has, has just disappeared, vaporized in the 17,000 years since. All of this was celebrating, all of this was celebrating something much deeper and broader than just the need to go out and get meat to eat. Uh, obviously it was, it was some expression of beauty. I mean, it, just magnificent painting celebrating the beauty, perhaps reverence, uh, spiritual, religious communion with these or animals, uh, perhaps some relationship, a symbolic relationship of power over the animals, the animals over us. Uh, this, is, this is part of the human experience of hunting. And I think going back this far, I think challenges a lot of conventional ways of thinking that hunter gatherers, well, they just hunted because they had to. Uh, well, in some sense they had to do it, but they didn't have to surround it with this wonderful world of art and probably religious ceremony and ritual of which these paintings are only the last, the tiny last remaining remnant of that, of that culture. Hunting obviously played a much bigger role than our life other than just eating. Um, and so early hunting peoples needed to hunt, but artistic and ritual expression of the hunt was, was, wasn't really necessary, but what it was there, it was there profoundly. It is in, in all of the hunter-gatherer cultures that survive into the modern age and have been studied by anthropologists, those artistic and ritual expressions are always there. They accompany hunting every time. So it had to be an expression of something much deeper and broader in our relationship to the world of which hunting 
with just one part. Um, this is something that comes from when I did a, a history of conservation webinar. I think it was last year. All these things disappear into the past very rapidly. And here we get a very clear expression of that relationship, that blood relationship. Here, Native American teachings are looking at animals, fish, trees, rocks as our brothers, sisters, uncles, and grandpas. In other words, I mean, they obviously didn't literally believe it was their uncle or grandfather, but they understood it as a blood relation, as something from which they, there was a common descent amongst them and all the things around them. Uh, these are our older relatives, the ones that came before us and taught us how to live. This is incidentally uh, a poem from the Anishinaabe peoples of the eastern, northeastern United States with the Iroquois, where one part is a Thanksgiving prayer. It's very long. I invite you to, 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 to look it up online, the Iroquois or Anishinaabe Thanksgiving prayer. It's a wonderful prayer. Just picking out a couple, few stanzas uh, from there. Here's one that really celebrates the earth from the source of things. Uh, she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk upon her. It gives us joy as she continues to care for us. As she has from the beginning of time to our mother, we send greetings and thanks. There's that relationship, uh, both of, well, respect, reciprocity, and gratitude all together there that I mentioned before. And here specifically talking to the animals. Uh, we are honored by them when they give up their lives so that we may use their bodies as food for our people. That's a remarkable statement. When I, when I was preparing that previous Tom talk, I read this and I just stopped on that line because it, it turns the relationship upside down, doesn't it? We all as hunters think of ourselves as pursuing the animal and, and, uh, and taking the animal and that's a part of the hunt. But here we have a people in which hunting was a major part of their life and they saw at least partly they saw that flipped completely upside down that that nature or, or or the or the earth mother or the animals were giving themselves to us we were receiving a gift rather than taking something we were receiving a gift that's a remarkable transposition of that of that relationship this is all part of their concept of the honorable harvest i'm going to keep coming back to those words because i think I think while they're present in hunting today, they're certainly present in our culture today. They perhaps aren't really central to how many of us, at least certainly, in, I'm talking a lot about myself, how I grew up thinking about hunting. Um, so the, this is gross oversimplification. I, I must apologize for it because the indigenous worldview, of course, includes thousands of different cultures over many, many thousands of years. But as far as as far as we can find out from anthropologists, uh, their relationship to the world was that of receiving a gift. They went out and hunted, they pursued, they captured, they killed, they ate, but they understood it in a larger sense as receiving a gift from the world. And we tend to think of that as an act of pursuit and possession uh, as people belonging to a modern society. And this is true, this isn't just true of hunting, it's just true of our worldview today. We, we see ourselves as rational free agents relating to a resource. If we're smart, we do it sustainably. If we're not smart, we do it wastefully. But it's really a, a relationship of the thinking subject, ourself to the objects of nature. And uh, it's pretty clear when you, when you start to read about uh, hunter gatherer and subsistence peoples that they saw it as a world, hunting as a part of a, a relation to, to the blood relations of the world characterized by respect, gratitude, and reciprocity. And, I, and those, th these are key, and I could, have picked, I could have picked other words, I just picked these words, but these words to me captured that, and, and, and they are still present in our world today. It's an important part. If they were just strange words, strange relationships we couldn't recognize, it wouldn't do us any good. But the relationships that were absolutely central to hunting culture in a distant past that are marginal today and that could become more central today as we move forward. Why do we hunt? Really, again, coming back to that initial question, I did this before Jackie came up with the poll, but my answers are pretty much like Jackie's. I think when I started hunting a long time ago, filling 
my bag limit, whether it was rabbits or when I went pheasant hunting with my dad and I, when we lived there many, many years ago, um, I was fascinated with the bag limit. And I've always been a very technically oriented person. I love technologies. I, I, I didn't see them. Not many people were fascinated with the gear of hunting. I've always been fascinated with the gear. There was a time between stints in college many years ago when I thought college wasn't for me. Uh, that I was thinking about becoming a gunsmith because I loved mechanisms, I loved taking them apart and putting them together, whether it was a motorcycle or a gun or anything else. I just loved mechanisms. And so the technology that hunt always fascinated me, still fascinate me. But as I grew older, other things really took center stage. Those, those moved into the background and personal relationships to people and the past have become more and more important to me. It's just part of getting old, I suppose. And uh, Enjoyment of time spent outdoors, that was a, I mean, who, who, I didn't know how anyone could hunt that didn't enjoy their time outdoors. It would be like being miserable while you're trying to enjoy yourself. Um, focused on the intentional observation, the habits and behavior of animals we hunt. That was, I think that's always been at least a minor thing and has become a more important thing to me as I've gotten gotten older. Uh, the next one, I'm not clear it was in Jackie's list. It's, 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 something that you know i've been asking myself these questions really hard for the last 30 years for the first 20 years of hunting i don't think i really thought much about going beyond the surface but for the last 30 years i keep asking myself these questions and i think the life and death of the world around us i think that's become important to me as opposed to just being a spectator of nature i'm actually involved in something if i don't quite really completely understand my involvement at least i'm involved in it it's a, it's a basis for trying to understand that relationship. This is a person in the modern world trying to understand hunting, very different from, from explanations that might have been given by those people who lived 17,000 years ago. Who hunts? So who are the people who hunt today? And the first thing uh, I think we all need to realize as hunters is there are fewer and fewer of us with each passing year. And that's not a good thing for, for for hunting as a pastime. Uh, it, it, it is threatening to lose its political relevance um, and its social importance. And things can't continue to lose their political relevance and social importance indefinitely without disappearing. So this is a real issue all of us, all of us need to think about as we think about what hunting is today and what it could be tomorrow. Uh, what it is today is very good, I think, um, but maybe it's not good enough. These numbers would tell me that what hunting has been for the last 20 or 30 years hasn't been good enough in order to engage the public and to, and to keep more young hunters coming into the field or old hunters for that matter, coming in, into the field with us, we're losing out. Um, uh, well, just a, few, just a few things about who are hunters. Uh, populations that live outside of major metropolitan areas are much more likely to be hunters than people who live in these major metropolitan areas. That probably doesn't surprise us, but it is a trend we need to worry about because more and more and more of us are living in cities as time goes on and, and we get further and further and further away, even for those of us who live in suburbs and cities today. I had a father who grew up in a tiny little town Georgetown, Kentucky, near Lexington. Now Georgetown is much bigger than Toyota plant moved in the 1980s, I think, or 70s. And the town is, has grown by leaps and bounds. But it was just tiny little town in the depression of Northern Kentucky. And so his habits were transferred to me. But now I'm one more, my, my children, my children's children, their children's children are, are more and more separated from that rural experience and from the experience of hunting that's that's a problem we need to solve as hunters and hunters are getting older uh i've fallen off the right side of this graph and in, into oblivion over here somewhere um because i'm 70 now so i'm at that point the, num the numbers start going down because hunters just age out because of physical disabilities as you can see that the highest percentage six percent is of people um between 55 and 64, that's twice as many as people of high school 
a 16 and 17 year olds, that's, that's an issue for hunters. Anytime you look at a top heavy age distribution, you're looking at a population that's shrinking and in danger of dying out. And that's true whether you're looking at a population of trees, whether you're looking at a population of animals or plants, when it's dominated by older individuals and there are few younger individuals, you're looking at a population that's dying out. And this is something we need to confront as hunters if, if we want hunting to be a pastime, a common pastime, one that still contributes to the cause of conservation by the year 3000. It's great that old people can continue to hunt. I can only hope that I'd live to be 92, much less 103. And I certainly hope if I do live that long that I continue to enjoy my time in the field as a hunter. These, this is our great things, uh, but the fact that hunters are getting older is not so great. Um, this is another, this is a density distribution of hunters. Uh, I use this one from Arizona. It's 10 years old now, but this is a, the best graph I could find that really depicts that aging population. The modal hunter in, in, uh, in 1992 was 35 years old in Arizona, and the modal hunter now is about 53 years old. They, so the modal, modal, meaning the most common age group, is almost 20 years older, 20 years later. So hunters aren't replacing themselves. Again, this, this, this trend is a trend of a population that's dying out and we need to do something about that in order to persist as hunters into the future, not just the people that are on this podcast today, but your children, their children and their children. How is this going to play out in the future? Uh, and now men and women in hunting, um, issues of gender, if we go back, Food provisioning for, for hunter-gatherer peoples was very much uh, uh, both genders in hunter-gatherer societies. Um, most food actually came from gathering uh, from all but uh, the Arctic peoples, uh, Inuit peoples of the far north, uh, really not much to gather up there in terms of plant food, so they were much more hunter-gatherer people. Others are more truly gatherer hunter peoples with most calories coming from plant foods for the obvious reason that plants are all around us and they're more abundant and easier to find. And it's also um, true that women played the leading role in gathering, but that's really not, wasn't entirely true. Women often played roles in hunting small game in those societies in the division of labor with women gathering and men hunting was statistically true, but certainly with many, many exceptions. Anthropologists have recently uh, discovered that women played roles in even big game hunting uh, in South America. Probably that's probably about 5,000 years ago. And even today in hunter-gatherer societies, there are girls practicing with blowpipes in the Batek tribe um, in Africa, hunting small game. So women, weren't categorically just gatherers. They were also participated in hunting in those societies and women participate in hunting today. So I had to put that picture on the left end because I had an Airedale when I was back in the 1970s and uh, I've never forgotten Skipper. That, that it always, always pulls on my heartstrings to see an Airedale. So women are participating in hunting today, but not a lot of them. Uh, this, these are numbers from at least fairly recent past. Uh, Illinois um, uh, DNR says 7% of licensed hunters uh, from the harvest reports were women. This U.S. Census Bureau 2016 says 10%. Given that over half the population are women, that's, that's a potential a group of people that are, that are underrepresented in hunters that can be represented more commonly in the future if we're thinking about where does hunting go from here, how does it survive as we move into the future, more actively engaging women in hunting is, is one of those ways to do that. Uh, the number of women in hunting today, according to the National Shooting Sports Foundation, I, it's hard to find numbers for this, so I have to take what I can get. They're saying between 2008 and 2012, uh, the numbers increased 10%. Over just four years, I mean, that's a huge increase. That doesn't sound like a sustainable increase to me, but it's a huge increase today. And I can certainly believe that women are becoming more actively becoming a part of hunting today. But the problem with that statistic 
is if you project that 10% increase backwards, you realize that we, you come to zero pretty quickly. And that hunting really, when I started hunting, was almost exclusively a male affair. And it's only recently where we started to, to increase the participation of women and that we need to work at that much harder. If you go online, you can see here is Instagram. Lots of women are becoming interested in hunting. Uh, you can find them on Facebook uh, and social media. So this is a movement that's starting that needs to be encouraged, needs to be engaged both within our county and in other counties. This, this, this is important to the future of hunting. As is the participation of other um, ethnic groups, uh, African-American participation in hunting is active today. I, I personally have never met an African-American when I was hunting. That doesn't surprise me because if you look at the numbers, uh, again, these statistics are hard to get in. Sometimes the statistics I get slightly uh, conflict with one another. Here it shows Asian Af African-Americans is what looks like less than 1%. If we look at numbers from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, it says that African-Americans, Asians, and Hispanics together make up fewer than 2% of hunters today. That's frankly, that's an embarrassing statistic. Um, that's, uh, that's probably 20, 30% of our population today and 2% of them hunt today. Um, if you look on the web, you find that, that there are African-American groups that are trying to, to reach out to their community to, be, to become in, more engaged in the hunting experience. We need to reach out to them to include them in, in, in the hunting experience. Likewise, with Latino, Latina communities. Uh, this this uh, comes from Arizona. Yes, Air, no, Colorado, excuse me. Um, talking about Latin, engaging Latino voices in conservation, in particular in hunting, they, they came up with this very interesting statistic this is really important. 93%, this is the, the Latino, Latino community in Colorado, 93% support creation of new national parks, monuments, wildlife refuges, and tribal protected areas. 93% agree that despite state budget shortfalls, we should fund the protection of state land, water, and wildlife. I mean, what statistics could be more encouraging about engaging this population in the causes of conservation and getting them involved in hunting? This is an underrepresented group and a group we need to be reaching out to as hunters and including in how we think about hunting and the future of hunting. Um, hunting is a sport. Uh, you know, even as a child, when people talked about hunting as a sport, that word sport bothered me. It bothered me because as much as I liked hunting, it didn't seem at all like baseball or football. I mean, those are those were the sports that I knew about and participated in. And hunting didn't seem like a sport at all. Um, is it really, I mean, competition is not really a competitive activity. Um, it's fairness, I think fairness is, actually a very important concept in hunting, but it means something so totally different than fairness in a baseball game or fairness in a football game or fairness in a tennis match. Um, but that word sport really, um, if you go back, it's a, it's a, actually comes from a French origin. It simply means to distract people, I assume distract them from the cares of everyday life and I suppose, you know, baseball and football are all distractions. I don't play football, I don't get paid for it. And so watching football or reading about it in the newspaper is a distraction. I don't, you know, if I'm a Bear fan, I don't, I always like it when they win, but you know, when they lose, it's not a personal failure for myself. Uh, it's a distraction. It, it maybe makes life a little bit easier and more fun. Um, but I want to talk about hunting as a sport and really just look at the, dis the distinction between necessity and choice, because I, I really have a hard time with 
the spork label and making much sense out of it. I mean, everything is a distraction, I suppose. Watching television is a distraction, but I don't call that a sport. But I wanna look at that distinction between necessity and choice. And if you go back um, six, 7,000 years, you find out that animals were already domesticated in Egypt and North Africa, meaning that once you had domesticated animals, uh, you really didn't need to hunt anymore if you wanted meat. Uh, it was already available in large quantities. The reason we domesticated animals was to, was to acquire that easy and more convenient and more reliable source of meat protein for civilization. That's why we domesticated animals. And yet hunting persisted in those communities. Uh, it was, I mean, at, least, at least as it comes down to, it was pharaohs and kings that were hunting lions and large beasts from chariots, but yet that was, that was very much not a necessary activity, um, along with hunting small game. It, so hunting continued, even after the domestication of livestock, hunting continued as an engaging and involving activity for people after it was no longer really necessary. And we can look at another great Example, I love the Odyssey, great book. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Uh, really at the dawn, really of Western civilization as we know it today, an ancient sort of late Bronze Age uh, warrior culture in ancient Greece. Uh, Odysseus, uh, you know, as a man goes into the Trojan Wars and then he's venturing back from the wars and takes 20 years to get back to the home island of Ithaca, which has now been inhabited by uh, people who are trying to woo his wife and take over his kingdom. Uh, but the story involves an early episode in Odysseus's life in which he's boar hunting, wild boar hunting with a spear. Now there, there's um, something not, none of us maybe would do today. The dogs would bay the boar, hold, hold the boar stationary, and then the hunter would dispatch it with a spear. And so Odysseus was the first to raise his spear to try to drive it into the brute, but the boar was too quick for him and charged him sideways, ripping him above the knee with a gash that tore deep, though it did not reach the bone. This becomes important later in the novel when that scar reveals Odysseus to, to his servant who, uh, who will end up helping him in his uh, attempt to regain his kingdom. Uh, so that's 3,000 years ago. We can look in the Bible in the Old Testament. Here is Isaac talking to his older son Esau and telling him, I'm old, I do not know the day of my death. Now take thy weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out into the field and hunt game for me and make me good tasting meat such as I love etc cetera, etc cetera. so again in a society with domesticated animals in which people could have eaten goats and uh and and uh sheep and cattle to their heart's extent still wanted to go out and hunt so sport hunting in the sense of not necessary hunting really goes back thousands of years in our societies and their predecessors and we still do it today in a very, very long tradition. Sport hunting is not something that was invented recently in the modern age, but we still do it in the modern age. Um, um, sport hunting isn't new um, and it's important now. We often, and, uh, and I think that was one of the responses uh, um, Jackie put in, in, the, in our, in our uh, quiz there to start with, was about conserving wildlife populations. The practical economic benefits of hunting are important. Probably the hardest picture for most people, particularly for non-hunters, but I've made even for me, is to look at a dead giraffe with a person standing in front of it. It's just the size and magnificence of, of the animal it makes that a hard picture to look at. Um, but this picture came from an article that was extolling the virtues of hunting and its necessity in preserving these game populations in Africa that are constantly under the threat of habitat loss and poaching. And the only ways that habitat in those populations can be maintained is through uh, controlled uh, large game or trophy hunting. Um, and it reminds me of a story that I heard uh, this relationship between, between using and worth 
back in the 80s when I my last stint in college, uh, there was a visiting professor who came to talk about tropical deforestation at the University of Michigan. Uh, and he talked of the worst thing, he said the worst thing you can do to stop tropical deforestation was to put in a logging ban. Um, because when you did that, you made the forest worthless. And as soon as you make the forest worthless to the people who live in the country, they get rid of it. They get rid of the forest, they cut it down, they replace it with, with fields of crops or with, with fields to graze cattle because that land is then worth something. You've made the forest worthless and so they get rid of the forest. So we have to be careful about what we want in preserving animals because in, for instance, banning the hunting of large game in Africa makes the animal economically worthless. And once it becomes economically worthless, the country becomes unable to protect it anymore from the people that, that live there or for the people that live there. But that's actually true of both of these other photographs that are more familiar to us for the pronghorn horn, horned antelope hunter out west or with the pheasant hunter like myself. In Illinois, we depend on on that our hunter dollars preserve habitat for game animals uh, and create a system of regulated hunting that tries to preserve those populations. This is a part of the practical economic, uh, and you might say institutional worth of animals. But again, I wanna ask the question of those other relationships that run much deeper in the culture of hunting and I think are important to hunting going forward and how attractive hunting is to populations of people and incorporating into, into the population of people who are hunting today. So and sport hunting. Question. Okay, go ahead. What about ecotourism? Trophy animals may be worth more alive than dead. That's that that's certainly true. Um, ecotourism is important and it's important to the nations like Kenya. It's a part of an economic model. Uh, but it's important of an economic model that now, or at least according to the nations that are doing it, and we'll have to trust them on this, according to them, that we'll call just call it trophy hunting, that is an important economic benefit along with ecotourism. Hunting doesn't, doesn't eliminate the animals, it's part of preserving the populations for ecotourism. I mean, you could have ecotourism without hunting, certainly, but you would have to raise as much money with ecotourism as you do with hunting, and that has been problematic for these countries. Um, that, I guess that would, I'm really, I'd have to be a game manager in Kenya to give you, you a much better answer to that question. Right now, it would seem that that is a part of the sustainable economic model for maintaining these populations in Africa at the present. Thank you. Uh, so hunting, sport hunting in the sense of, of it's a part of volition. It's not something we need to do anymore. We can all go to the store and get whatever meat we want. We can get meat that's organically raised or ethically raised. We can, um, and hunting gives us supply of that, but it's not really necessary today. It's a, but it's been a part of our civilization for a very, very long time. I wanna stop now and just see if there are any other questions or comments at, at this point. I've got, much more to do, but um, I've been talking pretty much non-stop. This is, there are issues that I'm dealing with here that are sort of unlike a presentation on tree identification where most of it is fact, all of it is fact, I hope, uh, about the physiology and anatomy of trees and about differences between species. This really has to do with the human pastime and motivations for people to do things. And I've tried to work my way through it and tried to understand that, but it's certainly subject to different opinions on this. So I really welcome any, anyone else's opinions on this to anything I've said so far, I'll, or I'll, I can just keep going. And you can either unmute and ask your question or type it in the chat. Um, if you start to talk and somebody else also starts to talk, there is an option to raise your hand, but either way is fine. Now, can I ask a quick question or make a comment? 
Sure, go ahead. Okay. No, I think this has been excellent so far. And it's just so interesting as, you know, I was a fisheries and wildlife biology major and you teach, you, you know, you're taught game management. And then again, when I started at the district, you know, we look at there's certain populations and it goes to the local here and then all sort of Africa, whether it's elephants or giraffes. I mean, in some cases, those populations do need to be controlled and you can either do it through culling or hunting or whatever, because there's limited habitat, kind of like you mentioned. And again, even at the district here and other places in the United States, deer, and there's all sorts of uh, scientific literature on deer that there does need to be hunting or some kind of culling in order to match that population. So yeah, and, and you could still enjoy it and get a food value, but then, and I think I know you're gonna talk about the district program, how it rolls right into that, or you can get all these benefits and still maintain a healthy population. Um, so it, it's it's multifaceted. I'm glad you're covering it from such a broad perspective because you can't just put your finger on the topic in one small area. Yeah, thank, well, thank, you, Brad. thank you, Brad. I'm, uh, that's we'll touch a little bit more on that in the end of the presentation. I had to make some choices about what I what I talked about today. I'm not going to go deep into wildlife management, but Brad's right. I mean, deer. Uh, well, in, in in Africa, elephant populations because they they uh, they don't have a lot of natural predators, uh, and and uh, given. And given the pressures of human populations and the needs of, of poor human populations nearby, el elephant populations and human populations have come into conflict. So uh, there is a need to control those populations at levels that can allow both the preservation of the elephant population and the, and the, the welfare of the human population too. So there are often a lot of difficult questions that have to be answered in managing populations. Deer today are... Uh, uh, you know, uh, become a pest species in certain contexts or a game species in other contexts, but certainly in the world today, in, in part, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that later because we'll talk a little bit more about, about that later. But th thank you for bringing that up, Barry. We'll have Durs go next. I saw you unmute. Yeah, thanks. Uh, no, it's been great so far, Tom. I, uh, I'm not a hunter, but I have, I've always appreciated hunters but I have a much, much deeper appreciation of hunters now. Uh, but my question, and I think I'm kind of guessing you're probably going to get to it. Um, I, I do a lot of work in the Calumet area where in Lake Calumet in the 1800s, uh, they had hunting competitions, you know, where hunters would kill three, 400 waterfowl um, just for, for count numbers, you know, not to, not to be, uh, not to save the meat or the carcasses. And then, you know, what what we did to the American buffalo or bison, where <clears throat> things basically just be, you know, society just was out of control. Um, and, and, and so there's that, you know, there's that other part of society hunting. I, th I think what you've really uh, zeroed in on is the personal one-on-one -on -one motivation for hunting that is respectful or even within a uh, kind of a limited size cultural society but versus the abuses incredible abuses overfishing in the oceans you know i mean it's still going on today um, some of which is was buffalo driven by the military wanting to wipe out the indians um, a lot of over killing today of animals driven by corporations trying trying to feed seven eight billion people in the world and so i don't know i, I i'm assuming you'll get into some commentary on that i just that's the thing that's still just is, is incredibly frustrating when i think about hunting over hunting yeah well, thank you Durs. that yeah that was uh i think the next topic um when i talk, I mean, not in great depth, but talk about hunting in America and how that's evolved from uh, from an early, well, from a European society to early colonial society to, uh, to a sort of free for all by the end of the 19th century to some, to the evolution of more controlled, uh, a, a government controlled mediated hunting so there, there's hunt, hunting by the rules so so that we have today and and 
the various abuses that have occurred over time and still particularly in in, in commercial hunting which of which fisheries is sort of a part of that you know is still pretty much out of control in some cases anyway we'll come back we'll come to that late a little bit later go ahead robert yeah um i i am uh I'm a bow hunter. I like to hunt whitetails. And, uh, I'm from rig uh, originally from Minnesota. And I've got three grandsons here. I live in Cary. And uh, I mean, I've actually, they, each of them, they're, you know, they're 13, 10, and eight. And I've gotten each of them a, a bow. But there's so much competition from other things. And hunting around here is not so accessible. Uh, and you know it's swimming and sports and and iPads and phones. I mean, I, I have I'm having a tough time. Uh, they 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 want nothing to do with killing an animal. Well, and I, I think I, I don't. I'm looking for ideas. Yeah. Well, I think that's a. I'm glad you said that because I think that's probably something that a lot of people share that frustration where where you know my my experience, I was one generation away, away from a person who grew up in a tiny little town in Kentucky and who spent a lot of his boyhood outdoors. And so hunting was just, well, it was, it was commonplace. It was sort of everywhere around him. And so in a way that, you know, playing soccer is, you know, is, is very common and a part of, part of young people's lives today. I, I like soccer. I'm not mm -hmm. integrating soccer, but um, so, so that, uh, how do we how do we move forward in a society that has become increasingly urbanized uh, and more and more distant from the hunting experience? I mean, I don't have I don't have answered these questions, but I think they're questions that we all need to collectively ask and realize that we if we realize we don't have the answer and that we're not really good enough today. Hunting is good, but it's not good enough. If it was good enough, we wouldn't be looking at a declining number of hunters each year we wouldn't so it's not good enough we need we need to, to 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 think about how we can engage a broader number of hunters yes the young people also um increasing numbers of women people from other racial and ethnic groups all of these number underrepresented groups of which the young are one of them now need to be engaged by hunting um, you know mention that when we talk about our district hunting program but uh, but your, yours yours is a very common frustration and one I don't have easy answers for. Um, but I'm glad you I'm glad you asked the question. Thank you, Robert. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask a few questions or, or read some comments from the chat, and then after that we'll move on. Uh, mm -hmm. But we had a few uh, people sharing things in here, so we had a quote shared from Theodore Roosevelt, "Hunting lore." So it says, we need, in the interest of the community at large, a rigid system of game laws rigidly enforced, and it is not only admissible, but one may also say necessary to establish, under the control of the state, great national forest reserves, which shall also be breeding grounds and nurseries for wild game. But I should much regret to see grow up in this country a system of large private game preserves kept for the enjoyment of the very rich. One of the chief attractions of the life of the wilderness is its rugged and stalwart democracy. There, every man stands for what he actually is and can show himself. Well, we're gonna talk about Theodore Roosevelt here in, in just a minute when we talk about hunting in America. I think that, uh, yeah, um, he's, he's a he's a absolutely pivotal character in the history of conservation in this country and in, in the history of, of really modern hunting as we know it today hunting that occurs on public lands that occur that I have to buy a hunting license that I have to obey by certain rules both in the technologies I use and in how I conduct myself in the field all of that I mean Theodore Roosevelt played a huge part in, in that um, yeah a question is fishing considered a form of hunting well I I wasn't really thinking about fishing today I mean I probably should have been because it is exactly the same Thing. I mean, fishing, you have the option of putting the fish back, where in general, in hunting, you don't. Um, but it is the same, uh, at least fishing to eat, uh, is the same taking, uh, you know, pursuing and taking the life of another creature. Uh, it, it is a 
sport in the sense of a distraction. It's a pastime. It's enjoyable. Um, it has the same, I think, it's surrounded by the same moral issues, uh, and which I think which I think are important. And I think it's important to talk about them amongst ourselves and perhaps to young people um, and, and to not, not, to, not to look past those moral issues, but to talk about them. And so, yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, I, Durr's question sort of mentioned fisheries, but I think it's really a part of the same relationship to the world around us. Um, um, we had a couple recommendations for um podcasts and there was a month-long course in madison someone took that was called the land ethic reclaimed perceptive hunting with elder leopold um we had a comment your statement and explanation of why the worst thing society can do to a forest is to ban logging it was fascinating wish i heard that explanation years ago Had another question similar, how do I make hunting easier for kids to get involved? Um, have young kids in the program now, uh, and how can we do try out the sport where we can be a sponsor to take out people for first experience? It's hard to find programs that just introduce the sport. Well, I'm, I'm uh... when we get to talking about the district hunting program, both I'll, I'm going to sketch out. I mean, we, we certainly um, make an effort to involve young people. Gabe or Brad can add to that as we get to that part of the presentation today. I, mean, I think the district is aware of that issue. It's, it's, uh, it's an easier issue to be aware of than it is to solve, but that doesn't mean that the district and other organizations, I think, are actively working on it today. Um, maybe we don't have enough answers, but we're, we're all aware of it today and, and working on it. And last comment before I move on, um, although I hate the addiction to my grandkids having technology, I'd rather they researched or learned from their iPad than get a rifle. Well, I think that's a common, a common um, point of view. I, I think it's one I respect. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll just have to, I hope that person again, what I'm trying to do today is to talk to both hunters and non-hunters, truthfully, about the experience of hunting and where it fits into human life, because I, I think you can be a non-hunter, but you still have the same relationship to the living world around you. Um, and that's honestly what attracted me to doing this presentation. Not, not I, I, I didn't want to do it to repeat phrases that I'd heard before, but I wanted to do it to get to learn something myself, to get to get down. Um, beneath the conventional explanation. So um, so I hope everyone, both hunters and non-hunters can learn from the presentation today. Doesn't mean that you want to become a hunter at all. It just means that hope you can learn about the hunting experience. Okay. Great, we can move on. Hunting in America. So this is a, a brief, uh, you know, this, this could be a two hour presentation in and of itself. Um, Hunting, the way we, in, in the early 19th century, and even through most of the 19th century, if you read uh, sort of anecdotal histories, they're often in like county pub, county level publications. I've read, it, read a couple of them over the years that a person will be giving you a history of the county written in the late 19th century. And what they see is, as the defining transformation of the landscape that justifies their possession is farming. It's converting wilderness into a settled, safe, prosperous place for families to raise families to grow and to grow up and for children to grow up in. That was how they saw their accomplishment in settling the continent. Uh, and, and in part, it was our, our justification for seizing that land from Native Americans. We were putting it to a, to a, from our point of view, what was a higher use. Um, when you know, the comment on Theodore Roosevelt sort of got at this, that in Europe, up until fairly recently, hunting in Europe has been democratized probably in the last part of the 20th century, but really up through the early 20th century, hunting was the, was the 
was the right only of aristocrats because they owned all the land. <laughs> Private people are, you know, individuals lived in cities uh, or, or towns uh, and the land was owned by, by wealthy people, by the upper class. And so there were large hunting preserves. The upper class would invite other upper class people to come over and they would have shoots for grouse or pheasant later on when pheasants were introduced. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a pastime of the people, of the common people. Uh, I think in America evolved very differently because we, from the beginning, were essentially a middle-class society of lots of people, each of whom owned a little bit of the means of production in the sense of small farms. And we hunted on those farms. Um, and so hunting amongst a rural people of small town America of living on small farms was very close to the experience of lots and lots of people. And so hunting became a part of, of the American, really a, 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 a wide American pastime. Uh, and whereas Europe, in Europe, game was a scarce resource guarded on private estates. In America, it was abundant, therefore cheap, easily available food resource, at least initially. Um, I mean, that would change by the end of the 19th century, if not entirely, largely because harvesting um, food, hide and feathers became a business. Uh, there were no regulations on it. And so, um, I mean, I would, in the way hunting has been defined, really defined in the 20th century, really from the time of Theodore Roosevelt to the present, this, this wasn't really hunting to me. This was sort of mass slaughter. Uh, the bison were not simply, as I think Durs mentioned, weren't simply slaughtered for the market, but really as a part of a, of a, of a government program to deprive uh, the Plains Indians of a food resource and to break down their societies, but certainly market hunters were the agents that killed the buffalo and sent the hides back and just um, amazing, somewhere between amazing and disgusting pictures, mountains of buffalo skull. I was just, oddly, I was just down with the bison on our Pleasant Valley uh, um, little bison ranch we've got going there just yesterday in the pasture with them doing some uh, carefully in the pasture with them doing some GPSing of buffalo wallows and some of the little buffalo lawns the grazing areas they create uh, and so that picture is a little hard to deal with um, as are pictures of duck hunters with walls of hundreds of ducks this was this was not unusual at the end of the 19th century. And this is not a cartoon here. These were called punt guns. They could have bore diameters up to two inches, which is really small artillery pieces. They could be held to the shoulder or even mounted in a boat and fired into huge flocks of ducks. Um, this, uh, the, the Illinois River uh, in the early America up into the early 19th century was thought to be the greatest concentration of waterfowl on earth not just in Illinois, but on earth. I mean, just unbelievable. I mean, the, the lower Illinois, um, where Il the Illinois River from roughly the area of Starved Rock for the next hundred, a little bit before Starved Rock from, from, until it makes that bend and starts to go south as a very low gradient. It was very wide, almost like a giant wetland. And it supported enormous numbers of waterfowl. Uh, that would change dramatically, not just from, from, from market hunting, but from the miracle of reversing the flow of the Chicago River and sending all of our sewage uh, down the Illinois River. But uh, the decimation of wildlife populations uh, from habitat degradation and from hunting was enormous during the 19th century. And uh, I, I want to just back up for a minute and explain this because it's a really it's a fundamental principle which we use today in conservation. It's called uh, the tragedy of the commons. Uh, took on that name from a fellow named Garrett Hardin who wrote a short article. I just put the PDF there if you want later on, you wanna come back and, uh, and, and pick that up and, and, and read the tragedy of the commons. It's not in highly technical language, but it explains 
the problem of private access to a commons. In other words, we have a commons, we have a public area, an area that's not owned by any one person, and we have wildlife populations there, and we have individuals uh, just going out and, and removing uh, wildlife from that area, each one making the decision individually. Well, let's, let's look at this first from the standpoint of Garrett Hardin. He looked at it as a, as a sort of European commons in the olden days before the what they called enclosure and the el elimination of the commons. Um, if I had one cow to my herd, there's less grass for every cow so that my cow grows a little bit more slowly. But the key thing is I get the whole benefit of that additional cow, the whole benefit of the cow. I only pay, play a tiny marginal cost to, in terms of all the cattle. For the most part, I'm only paying a small cost. I'm getting a, a large benefit. So I keep adding more cattle. But if there are 10 other herdsmen who are doing the same thing, each of them deciding to add more cattle because each of them gets the, the additional benefit, the whole benefit of adding one cow, they only pay a marginal small cost for that one cow. They each keep making a decision until they degrade the commons and everyone is making is on the on the boundary of bankruptcy. This happens in fisheries all the time today. We keep fishing populations down until fishermen are going are going out of business because everyone makes a decision on their own about removing the fish and everyone wants to get the fish and not to give them to other people. So well, let's think of it in terms of hunting. I, at least my, I loved uh, Bugs Bunny, so I'll use Elmer Fudd as my hunter here. Um, if I harvest one additional adult deer, and I'm not gonna uh, here ignore the difference between bucks and does here, um, there'll be fewer fawns the next year if the adults are necessary to produce fawns. So if I harvest one deer, there are fewer fawns the next year, hence fewer deer to hunt. But I get the whole benefit of killing the one extra deer and the overall effect on the population is small. So if I'm making this decision wholly on my own, just for my own benefit, I go out and I shoot another deer. Why not? I'm getting the whole benefit of the additional deer, only a small marginal cost to the whole population. But if there are 10 other hunters out there, you get the picture. Um, each of them makes the, the same decision over and over again, and the population declines and declines until the cost and trouble of finding a deer is too high to bother and everyone essentially stops or they're basically to the point where hunting is almost worthless. This is, this is, this is really the condition of North America in a lot of areas toward the end of the 19th century when Theodore Roosevelt starts the Boone and Crockett Club. Shortly after that, he becomes president and is extolling the necessity of public lands and of, of public regulation of hunting. He sees this happening private when individuals, when people act as individuals, they cause a problem. When they act collectively through, through government, collectively coming together, they can solve a problem. That was really, I think, the key insight of Roosevelt and others uh, in the progressive political movement of that day to try to address these kind of problems. Um, I, I wanna I mean, one of the worst things you can do to historical character, I think, is you turn them into a marble statue. When we do it to George Washington, he's, he's not even a human being anymore. He's just a marble statue to which we attach three or four things. He never told a lie about cutting down the cherry tree and first president of the United States and whatever. I mean, we've made a marble statue of him. We don't really think of him about it as a human being. Um, in that case, if you read books about the Revolutionary War as a person who sort of learned on the job and made just tremendous number of tactical mistakes, whatever, we, we turn them into a marble statue. And once you use a marble statue, you don't want to learn about him anymore. How interesting is a marble statue? It's just one thing. And we did the same thing to Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he is I think the most important person in the history of, I mean, I, this, there's so many important people, but I, I think you could certainly make a case he's the most important person in the history of conservation in this country. And the most important point, most important person in shaping hunting as it exists today. Um, but I wanna look a little bit deeper at Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, he saw hunting 
up until Roosevelt, we saw farming as the defining American transformation of the landscape that justified our presence here and our, our removal of native peoples and our, and our uh, ownership and use of the landscape. Roosevelt, Roosevelt sort of flipped that on his head and he reinterpreted the American character as emerging from a confrontation with the rigors of nature in the wilderness, best exemplified, or in hunting really best exemplified that in modern life. Uh, and he felt it was essential to building uh, essential character building exercise, especially developing the manliness of the American male. And that's pretty explicit in Roosevelt's rhetoric of the day. Um, and he was also, I mean, this is why he's such an important pivotal figure in the history of conservation and hunting. He was also a champion of sustainable resource use um, and the management of wildlife. So it's these are two different things. Hunting, as Roosevelt sees this, as a, as a vitally important and character building exercise to preserve uh, in America and, is, and, is, and the need for government intervention for sustainable resource use. Um, he is instrumental in the early wildlife refuges. He expands the national park system. He takes the initial forest reserves and transform them, transforms them into the national forests and puts his friend Gifford Pinchot in charge of them and a huge expansion of national forest under Roosevelt. I think at the same time, states, state departments of conservation were forming. They were starting to preserve land and parks for public enjoyment following the federal model, uh, starting to regulate hunting within the states following uh, that that model that Roosevelt had suggested. So he is a, he is this incredibly important pivotal character in the history of conservation. But there's another part of that legacy we can't forget, and it's the part of the legacy we're we're struggling with today. And that's a legacy of a conservation movement that really wasn't open to all people, regardless of race, and it wasn't, and gender. Uh, that is a part of the legacy of conservation and hunting before World War II. And the progressive movement, certainly not Roosevelt as an individual, but the progressive movement, that word progressive is, is, has changed its political meaning so many times over the years. But um, amongst those parts, and I go into this in much more detail in the history of conservation, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. This is not an attack on Roosevelt. It's really, it's really trying to understand where we are today and what we need to do to be better. Okay? So... Uh, the progressive movement was uh, advocated eugenics. It was uh, into race theory and race superiority and, and all of these sorts of ideas that seem pretty primitive today, but were very much, uh, very much in the political mainstream of the time. It's not surprising that conservation was mostly white and mostly male before World War II. And, and the important part is we're dealing with that legacy today. This is a legacy we need to overcome if hunting is going to survive. And being honest about the past, as I said, Roosevelt, the most important pivotal figure in, in hunting as we know it today, that doesn't mean he was perfect or that the political movements of the time were perfect. We need to overcome that second legacy today as we move forward. This is the good thing. This is the good thing that came from, from Roosevelt, not just the wildlife refuges, but uh, just, just the enormous uh, um, legacy of public lands today. Not only Roosevelt, others certainly, the National Park Service started 30 years before Roosevelt, but, but this, is, this is a huge, hugely important to, to all of our efforts today in conservation and likewise, the ideas of game laws and bag limits and, and the ethics of hunting and what you, what if when I use my father's shotgun that it's an automatic shotgun and so it could fire five rounds, I put a plug in that reduces it to three rounds. Uh, that's a part of, that's a part of the regulation of hunting today. That's a part of the regulation that I have to, uh, that I have to abide by because I, I want to abide by it because it's a part of managing game populations today and making sure that they're there for future generations. 
The story of hunting couldn't wouldn't be complete without talking about how critically important hunter dollars have been to conservation as we know it today. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. There's just some examples in Wyoming, 55% of the budget of fish, of fish and game department comes from the sale of licenses and fees. Ducks Unlimited has conserved more than 14 million acres of a private not-for-profit, 14 million acres of land since 1937. Um, Six million acres of habitat have been conserved with the help of the duck stamp. Funds of Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937 charges hunters an extra tax of 11%. That's a pretty healthy tax, 11% on the purchase of firearms and ammunition and archery equipment. That's provided billions of dollars for wildlife conservation since that time. Uh, that's an 11% tax. That's a big tax to put up with, but hunters have put up with that tax and they've paid it for a long time. And that's been a huge benefit to wildlife, uh, the sales, I think this is Ill revenue generated by license sales equates to more than a billion dollars a year nationally for hunting. So these are these are important numbers. If you want to, this is this is a part of the part of the the economic model of conservation today. Um, I mentioned a lot about the personal and moral part of hunting day. I'm going to come back to that again in a big way. But this is a part of hunting today. It's a part of how we see conservation today. And we can't forget about that as we move forward. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these. These come from the Boone and Crockett Club. Incidentally, uh, um, I never really knew much about the Boone and Crockett Club. It was established by Roosevelt or he was at least pivotal in its establishment, I think 1887. So a little bit before he was president. But it's really about codes of ethics, um, and among other things. Uh, they, they establish this idea of a code of ethics. And that may seem like a no-brainer today because at least people that grow up hunting in the 20th and early 21st century understand there are rules and ethics for hunting. But this was kind of a new idea in 1887, at least a sort of universal code of ethics about hunters should behave and what they should do and what they shouldn't do. This is, this is a part of that transformation of conservation and hunting around the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Take a deep breath. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the district's hunting program. Uh, Gabe and Brad can, who have been much more deeply involved in the hunting program than I have can, uh, can join in and, and add to this as I go through it. This is really a, just a brief, Overview. Uh, it really fits in with a mission statement of the district that it's about benefits to present and future generations of people. Our managing of natural areas and open space, open spaces provides that benefit to present and future generations. And our hunting program, uh, we we're just talking about hunting ethics, maintains the highest ethical standards of fair chase and sportsmanship in North America. And fair chase and sportsmanship. Again, that word sport, I, I wish, somehow I wish that hadn't been applied to hunting a long time ago, but it's so ingrained in it now, I can't avoid it. I just dislike using the word sport for soccer and hunting together. Um, to me, hunting is a very different activity and using the same word just confuses things. But in any way, I can't get away from it. Fair chase, fairness is an, is, makes perfect sense within the culture of hunting. It makes no sense to people on the outside who have not hunted and see a sort of profound unfairness that I'm, I have a very large brain uh, and I have motor vehicles that carry me around and I have a weapon that can dispatch an animal that doesn't seem very fair. The animal doesn't have a car and it doesn't have a large brain and it doesn't have any weapons, but fair chase, can, it's best to understand that within the culture of hunting about hunting well or poorly. And if you are a hunter, that means a lot. If you're on the outside of hunting, hopefully after this presentation today, you'll at least understand what hunters mean by fairness. It's, it's not, it's not a, it means something very important within the culture of hunting and sportsmanship. Likewise, uh, I, this is sort of amalgam definition. I couldn't find one that I really like. So this amalgamates a couple of different ones, a respectful, respectful treatment of people and property in the course of hunting, 
and reasonable efforts to minimize suffering of the prey animal. Again, that makes sense only within the culture of hunting, within the practice of hunting. It doesn't make sense to someone looking at hunting from the outside. Central tenets, I think I came up with an idea of central tenets, but they seem to be central to me in the hunting program and safety being the first and most important one. Hunting uh, involves the use of weapons that can be dangerous to other people and so we have to be very careful with them. We put people in stands not simply so they can see things better, but because if I'm sitting on the ground, this firing angle of elevation, if I'm sitting on the ground and firing more or less on a level line at a deer, standing maybe 30 yards away, uh, that slug, when it hits the ground, has about a 100% chance of ricocheting, continuing to fly through the air, and perhaps hitting some animal I didn't intend, or hitting a person at some considerable distance from where I'm, I discharge the round. So when we put people up in a stand, we create an angle where, where the likelihood of a ricochet is very, very small or non-existent. The higher the angle, the more energy is expended as that slug or bullet hits the ground. And if we get that angle high enough, the bullet just stops when it hits the ground. That's what we're trying to do by putting people up in a stand, not just to give them a better view. I won't read all of these, but all of them are about uh, safety in our hunting program. Uh, we, we, uh, we put people up in stands, but we're also concerned about the safety of the hunter themselves. Once you get people up above the earth, they can fall down and hurt themselves getting up and coming down and in the stands. So we emphasize safety in using hunting stands. And we emphasize the reason for hunting stands is we want to get the hunter in areas where they can't hurt people. So we put buffers. This is for the archery buffer. Um, and I, I think the, the numbers have been covered up by the band at the top of the screen. It's a smaller buffer than um, the hunting buffer. But what it means is if I'm outside of this buffer and I put a hunting stand here, people where these stars are, people are, are, are in the safe zone. This buffer tells me I have, to, this is a safe buffer around places of human habitation and activity. So we're, we're, we're cognizant of where we put hunting stands. We're trying to protect hunters from one another from accidental shooting incidents. And we're trying to protect other people in our preserves and nearby from hunters also. Hey, Tom, we had a question. Okay. Um, so there was some discussion of like what's fairness for fair chase with baiting. Um, so okay. is baiting considered fair? That's a really good. That's a really good example because in Illinois, that's not considered part of fair chase and hunting. Um, distinguishing hunting from deer removal programs that are that are at, at that point deer become a pest, you have to remove them for the good of the ecosystem to prevent damage to neighbors' properties and from them eating all the little oaks in an area. That's deer removal. To me, that's not hunting. That's, that's another program. Uh, whereas, uh, for instance, in the state of Michigan, baiting is legal, or at least it was in the 80s. I assume it still is. That's legal. That's a part of fair chase. In Illinois, it isn't. So it's really a part of the culture of hunting is defined differently in Michigan than it is here. In Illinois, baiting is not legal for hunting deer. In, in Michigan, it is. So there is no hard and fast rule about that. It's about how, how, how the culture of hunting evolves in different places and what's considered fair and what isn't. I, mean, not, I don't know if that's a good enough answer, but that's it's the obvious answer. It is baiting is a part of fair chase in some places and not others. Any other questions? Not at the moment. Okay. Hunting ecologically self-sustaining populations. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, the conservation district. You know, the conservation district um, hosts a hunting program, but we're a conservation district. I'm, I'm out in the springtime surveying bird populations, in the summertime surveying. Uh, butterfly populations, um, 
I spend time monitoring uh, deer browse on our oaks that we're planting in our in our in our tree planting activities. We're constantly looking at, at the world around, not just around the hunting program, around our management of, of which the hunting program is part. We're constantly looking at how how our natural areas are responding to it in order to to tell us about our management activities, what should we do, or do more, what should we do less. Likewise, the hunting program occurs within, within an institution that, that cares an awful lot about, about how the world is responding to our management. Here we can see that the harvest totals of deer have remained, there may be a slight upward trend of that uh, over time. Remember, one of the purposes of the hunting program is to control deer populations. Deer populations do become over, over deer do become overpopulated in some of our conservation areas and cause excessive damage, particularly to plants and oak seedlings. And we need to control those. We're hoping our hunting program can do that for us. And so, uh, but this shows that our that our that our harvest should remain relatively stable over time. We're not causing deer populations to plummet to zero. We're maintaining those at a reasonable level, and we've been able to to include uh, an increasing number of hunters over time. So that's that's a that's really a success for the hunting program. Be able to engage more people to involve them in the hunting program and and, uh, and to keep the keep the deer populations and deer harvests more or less stable over time. This is just a simple graphical model for how, how plant populations can be affected by browsing. I'm thinking more because of my involvement in monitoring deer browse in, in our oak plantings. Uh, let's, let's say the blue, the blue circles are oaks that over time with selective browsing, we can see that some of those are dying out and excessive browsing may cause all of them to die out. And so, or at least if not die out, oaks are good sprouters, but if they're ever gonna get more than three feet tall, we need to keep deer populations at a level where some of those uh, can escape. So that part of our deer management program is part of the scientific management of wildlife to preserve both the deer population and to get oak reproduction in our in our conservation areas, it's both, and so um, it's a part of that self ecologically self sustaining populations. And I probably don't need to go into this. Probably most of you are aware that our 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 conservation areas host an enormous number of activities and an enormous number of people. Our hunting program has to be integrated with families visiting the woods, with public programs, with bicycle groups with our own management of the landscape here, our prescribed burn. Uh, and with our volunteer program, Jackie has volunteers out all over our conservation areas just all year long, but also in the fall during hunting program. And hunt, the hunting program has to be integrated with this larger, larger program of, of addressing the public. Uh, and I think we do a very good job of that. I think I talked a little bit about this, about this development. I think early in life, we all tend to be oriented toward, toward getting our bag limits about the shooting part of it, about trophies. And word trophies has always been a slightly um, pejorative to me, but I, it, it plays a role. Um, um, but we tend to think more about this. And certainly at least me, I was always fascinated by my firearms and bows and arrows when I was little. Uh, um, and as we get older, what, what we're trying to do in the district program is to emphasize these stages in the development of the hunter to focus on ethics, fair chase, humane killing, and no wanton waste, that sportsman chase, but also that stewardship phase, which for me, uh, anyway, for me, really gets to those relationships of respect, gratitude, and reciprocity and defining what we would like to think of as a conservation hunter. To me, when I look at this, these are our conservation hunters in work days. Um, this is about re respect, gratitude, and reciprocity. This is about what the hunting program can do 
is doing, but can do more of, engage even more people and draw them into this larger relationship of caring for the landscape and caring for the animal populations. It's not just about a respectful and, and sportsmanlike hunting program. It's about drawing people into the larger conservation movement and getting them engaged because conservation faces some of the same demographic problems as hunting and it's become old and it's become white and we need and we need to engage young people and we need to engage other peoples unlike ourselves in order for both of those movements to really survive late into the 21st century and into the 22nd century. We really need to do that. It's not a want to do it, it's we need to do it. And the hunting program here, um, I mean, we've always, we've tried to engage young people in our hunts. I don't know if Brad or Gabe wanna, wanna talk about this at this point, but it's certainly a part of our hunting program, part of what we do. And it's really a part of how we, uh, it's that way of life, part of the mission of the district that, that trying to engage children in an activity that gets them involved in conservation and also in hunting. Okay. Um, and we got lots and lots of opportunities. If you're not a part of the hunting program and want to be, we have lots of opportunities. There's both deer, there's both firearms and bow hunting for deer. There's turkey hunting in the springtime. There's waterfowl hunting. And if you want to know more about, we have lots of different places to hunt. If you want to know more about that, there's the contact information, write it down quickly, or just look at this will be posted on our website pretty soon. Uh, and you can look at this and take that number down later. But Gabe, Gabe is the uh, fellow who runs our print hunting program. And I'm sure he would be anxious to answer your questions and to get you involved in the hunting program if you'd like, like to be. Final thoughts. And this, this, is, uh, this gets back to some of those personal and moral issues in hunting, which I think are important. I think they're important because they're how we relate to each other and in particular, how we relate to people who aren't hunters and how we talk about what we do and why we do it. Um, it's about the nature of killing, our personal involvement in that. And this is really personal to me because I keep asking, I've asked this question for 30 years. It is important to me. It's always been important to me. Why is it so important to me? Why? I mean, I've had lots of opportunities to walk away from it, but I haven't. Why, why does it mean so much to me today? Um, and I'm going to give it this eye of focal practice. You can forget the word, the term focal practice, but I, I came upon this reading and podcasts I've been listening to over the years it comes from a fellow named Albert Borgman who works at uh, the University of Idaho and he calls a focal practice a human activity that demands skill, patience, and attentiveness and are worthwhile in themselves, not merely in what they produce. So if hunting were a focal practice, it would be important for maybe for what it produces, maybe I mean, I had pheasant soup for Thanksgiving this year. That, that was one of the things I got from, from going hunting for pheasants. Uh, but it's focal practice. It was about a lot more than just that. Um, and that's to differentiate it from activities that are directed toward a maximizable goal of production that erase or, erase or ignore all relation, relationships of worth except one. Like, for instance, a family meal can be a focal practice. Uh, there are, it demands skill in its preparation and patience. It uh, requires a certain attentiveness to all the people who are present at the meal. Uh, it's worthwhile in and of itself. Yes, we get food through a family meal, but we get much more than that. Uh, it is a practice that at least for many of us, uh, I, I think still is for, for many, people important to that sense of family, that sense of, 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 the, of the communal nature of the family and the communication between individuals in the family. It's an incredibly important focal practice that's really different from grabbing a burger and jamming it in your mouth. And we all do this, I do it, when we're driving from one place to another and we just wanna absolutely minimize our time in eating. We're treating eating uh, as just a necessity we dispense with and throw away the wrappers afterward or they actually end up on the floor of my truck and I throw them out later. As opposed to a practice that has a much deeper and more important meaning in our lives. Um, and when we shift our focus away from that singular goal, it allows us to be guided by the relationships to people, community, 
familiar things which together orient us and give us an identity. It certainly does for me. Um, that is, uh, I, I don't personalize my time talks very often. That's actually a, a photo of uh, the three people I went and myself. I'm the one on the your left in this photograph. Um, fellow in the background in the center is someone I've hunted with for 51 years, his two sons I've hunted with since they were old enough to hunt. Uh, ben Center uh, is uh, had an accident. I was, it's uh, maybe 12 years ago and hasn't been able to hunt with us until this year. That was tremendously satisfying to me to have him out with us again. This year, he has a track chair, pretty expensive device, uh, and it was fascinating to watch how it worked. And I'm sure he had bought it just literally the day before our hunt started. So he was having a few problems with it, but by next time we go out, I'll have a year of practice. This, this, this gives me an identity. It orients me toward my life, toward a whole set of relationships. And, and as part of giving me an identity in a hunting is very much a focal practice for me. And within this broader context, there are technologies and behaviors that are appropriate and inappropriate to the occasion. Well, of course there are. When I was little, I couldn't wear a white t-shirt to dinner. That wasn't, that wasn't acceptable attire. My mother would send me back to my room and say, put on something else. Um, that wasn't a behavior that was acceptable. Interrupting other people talking wasn't acceptable. Using my tableware like a shovel wasn't acceptable. I had to learn how to be a part of, of that family occasion. It's true with all focal practices. You, you have to get into the culture of the practice, learn how to behave. And that's true of, I think, hunting is a focal practice also. Uh, limitations of technology. I'm I, I, in some sense, I'm a very technical person. I'm, I, I'm, I marvel at technology and technological improvements. At the same time, technology has, has it, its, its limits. Uh, technology in any endeavor is evaluated in relation to the possibility of failure or success. Excuse me, excess in any endeavor is valued in relation to the possibility of failure and the necessity of skill. Obviously, if I could, if I could go up to bat in a baseball game, I got a home run every time because I had a radar controlled bat and, and it would eject the ball over the fence every time I swung it, it would, there would be no skill, there would be no, there would be no sport. Yet the essence of technology is to expand the limited capabilities of the user um, to increase their capability and reduce the skill necessary and decrease our chance of failure. That's obvious, of course it is. Modern shotguns of which I have more or less modern. One of them is, they're both kind of old now, but they're still modern uh, in terms of 20th century technologies. Um, they decrease my chance of failure. If I were using a flintlock shotgun, it would be much, much harder. And yet, um, as a, as a, a lecture I listened to very recently, Aldous Huxley was a grandchild of Thomas Huxley, who was a buddy of Charles Darwin. Back in the back in the day, um, and Aldous became a sort of public intellectual through the middle of the 20th century. In a way, we I'm not sure we have public intellectuals in quite the same way today. I gave a lot of lectures, and he was talking about the limitations of technology. And he said, making something foolproof, which is essentially the goal of technology, is to also make it novelty proof. You can't really discover anything new. It make it inspiration proof and, and virtuoso proof because. The ultimate technology removes all, all necessity of skill. In the long term, technology of hunting have to be self-limiting. This is, this is my point, um, is that we all have to understand not just the state that tells us what we can do and what we can't do. Ultimately, technologies have to be self-limiting because we judge our success of our performance within the limits we choose. Uh, and. Uh, and that need to define hunting and, and the technologies of hunting self-limiting, I think, is critical to the whole idea of sportsmanship um, and fair chase. Um, technologies will soon give us uh, weapons that will make hunting, um, uh, I would say, will make hunting, uh, will essentially eliminate the need for hunting. And so we need to be self-limiting in those technologies and, and how we use them. 
consumerism and commodification to me and this and a lot of these things i'm talking about with technologies and consumerism this isn't just about hunting it's about the life we live today and about where technology invades our lives and where we welcome it into our lives and where we say no that's not enough i mean if i when uh when we were eating as a family, my children will be home for Thanksgiving. Uh, they know that you don't pull the smartphone out and bury your head in it during the family meal. That's just that's that's in, that's technology invading a part of our lives that simply isn't appropriate. Um, that's a self limitation on technologies, uh, and commercialization is the same way. I mean, at best, it can become a costly distraction. We end up going through catalogs and ordering things, and hunting becomes a. Uh, um, just closets full of gear that we have for doing it. Um, but at worst, the desire to accumulate gear and buy hunting opportunities can transform the animal into just another commodity. And that's a problem. And this happened to me not long ago uh, in hunting. I don't need to go through the details, but just getting involved in, in, in hunting at preserves and paying for animals one at a time, it just it just rang the wrong way to me. I just pulled back from it after a couple of experiences. For me, again, this is all personal. For me, it had commoditized the animal in a way I just wasn't comfortable with. And, the, and it really eliminates the moral relationship at that point. It's just something you're buying. And that wasn't acceptable to me. Um, because Killian is personal and intentional hunting allows us to confront the apparent dissonance or disagreement between our animality and our spirituality. That is our need to kill and eat and our need for relationship and communion. To me, these are so obvious when you look at people and their need to commune with nature, their need to communicate with it. And I think hunting is a part of that. And yet our need to kill and eat. Uh, and yet countless human cultures before us have created rituals and practices in order to bring these two things into right relation. And it's really our, our modern culture that's having such a hard time with it. That we have no way to deal with a problem because we systematically deny our animality and our need for communion both. And we look at, at the outdoors as recreation um, and eating is something we do by going to the grocery store. Hunting is older than humanity. We didn't invent it, we inherited it. In early human societies, um, transform what would appear to, to us to be a bloody necessity into a spiritual occasion. I put in the background another set of cave paintings for that very reason. It was a spiritual occasion. Obviously, when you look at those, ask your question, why would they do that? It was a spiritual occasion. It was a part of a much deeper and broader relationship of which hunting was an essential part. Hunting was necessary and spiritual to them. And that's a category that we simply have a hard time with today and we need to get our heads around. I mean, that's, I think that's for both hunters and non-hunters. Um, I think it's naive to think we can go back and just appropriate whole chunks from some indigenous culture and you know start doing cave paintings on our walls in our rooms. And somehow that's gonna, gonna rescue us. I, I don't believe that for a moment. I think that's a sort of careless cultural appropriation, but there are ideas that we can take from these people. And I've talked about them a lot already and their ideas of respect, gratitude and reciprocity. Really those aren't things we invented. There are parts of our life today that have been central to the experience of hunting in past societies and they can be central to us today going forward. And that's, I think, where I'd like really to leave you. Hunting does not depend on, or conservation doesn't depend on hunting, but I think it does depend on, on us reassessing and grounding our position in the world today. I'm certain of that. Hunting is one way that we may begin to do that. Thank you. I am going to stop sharing at this point. Uh, certainly take any questions. I, that went a little bit longer than I expected. It always does when I actually give a presentation. So I get kind of revved up in the presentation and, and, uh, and don't want to stop. But any, any questions now or comments? Uh, this was uh, 
I would say this was one of the hardest presentations I've done and it was hardest because it was personal in a way that some of the other ones, I mean, trees are personal to me, but I can kind of take my life as a naturalist and a botanist and divide it for myself as a, uh, for my personal life and just talk about the trees. Whereas this one, I really had to, had to go back to my own experiences more and that, ma that made it hard, but I hope you enjoyed it today. But I'd certainly not just questions, any comments you have, any ways you would add to this, disagree with it, add to it, uh, questions about it. I mean, I, I, there's a lot of questions I can't answer, but uh, you're certainly welcome to ask them because maybe somebody else can, or maybe they would enlighten all of us just to listen to the question. It's like we got a hand raised for Robert. Okay. I, uh, I just want to make a comment. Um, in years past, we, um, my brothers and I, we, we used to go uh, like to Wyoming or uh, Dakotas or Montana. And uh, although the, the percentage of hunters is going down, the number of hunters evidently must be going up because there are more and more restrictions about going out of state. And it is becoming a rich man's sport to do that. You know, it used to be pretty, pretty easy for a common guy to go to uh, Wyoming and get a, an elk license or a, a mule deer license, but now they're putting on quotas and all kinds of fees. So, I mean, although, although the percentage of hunters is going down, the population is going up and states are putting on these regulations that kind of limit you going out of state i guess you have you have to find you have to find places in your own state because we've drawn borders and you know except it's us and them That's what well, it seems to me. i i uh, i i can um feel feel for it because i i just spent a week in or yeah, a week in South Dakota hunting pheasants. I had to pay a lot of money for that license, much more than yeah. I'm hunting right. here today. So it's a, I mean, in terms of the number of hunters, I think the number of hunters is going down. I think what's changing is the way that that state agencies have to manage game and, and how they distribute those fees in order. This is a these are vital that that's their vital um, financial resources for these state agencies, how they distribute those fees. Uh, sometimes they're sometimes at least they're under pressure from in-state hunters to 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 distribute more of those game animals to in-state hunters and fewer to out-of-state, and so they increase fees on out-of-state hunters. I mean, you really need to have someone that was working in state agencies to answer that question. I'm I'm not on on the inside of those decisions, so but I I certainly um, I certainly sympathize with your your ideas because I've had to pay those fees the last four or five years and it's uh it's pretty steep uh, even just for hunting pheasants so if i were hunting large game i would have to pay more tag fees on top of that read a couple of questions from the chat um for brad and gabe has or would the district ever consider hunting possibilities geared towards senior hunters that may be interested for example setting aside certain locales and tweaking rules if needed in a way so as to accommodate them The district has uh, an opportunity for hunters at the time of application to provide a need for accommodation, and we do those on a case by case basis so that does exist within the context of the program, we just need to know at the time of application so that we can put people in the right places. And yeah, one thing I wanted to add, and in, um, the district does have we've gone to hunter safety we've been teaching hunter safety for quite a long time. And then our education department does have a hunter safety camp. So we're bringing in kids, they're learning about it, they're getting a great experience. Um, but what I found on private land, and I think Gabe could, um, and others can say the same thing, is when you're willing to go and help out a landowner or a farmer um, with management, and that goes to the, um, the conservation or stewardship hunter, that goes a long way to getting yourself permission and keeping that permission to hunt a piece of property. So again, it's that giving back. And then as a hunter, you feel that special connection that, you know, it's not a food plot, but you maybe helped trap beaver or you managed an area, you cleared brush, or you've sprayed an invasive plant. 
um, and maybe it is a food plot, but you've actually helped improve that habitat, you've helped the landowner, and then that is a goal, it's a long way to getting yourself permission um, to hunt land. And then with the district program that Gabe's developed is we do have this stewardship program where, yeah, you can go out and you can actually help um, us manage habitat and it just makes for better hunting. So there is opportunities um, to give back for sure. And I'll add a comment to if uh, we're approaching 12 o'clock, if you have to get going, you're more than welcome to go. We're going to keep answering questions for a bit. Um, so I'll read another one from the chat. Um, a comment. Some deer hunters go so far as to choose to shoot older or lame deer as a way to protect the health of the herd. Um, lots of thank yous. Um, <laughs> thank you for the thank yous. Um, Comment, excellent content. I've always been averse to hunting, yet your presentation uh, helps me to see that as a meat eater, I'm part of the universe of the killing. Lots to think about. I do appreciate your linking hunting and conservation. Interesting. I appreciate your openness to various thoughts and feelings. I think hunting and conservation have been joined at the hip for over 100 years now. And I think both hunters and conservationists should see that as an opportunity, not as just a chance historical overlap, but as an opportunity going forward. I, th I, I truly think that hunting can teach us something fundamental about our relationship to the living world. And that is a part of our relationship to conserving that world. I, I really think those two, it doesn't mean you have to be a hunter, of course not. But it means you need to think about that relationship and hunting is, is one avenue uh, of approaching and, and I mean, I'm not to the bottom of it yet. I've been, I mean, at least for the last 30 years, it is, uh, if not obsessed to me, at least just come back over and over and over and over and over again, asking myself questions about my involvement and why I do it. And I think it's it's just been very valuable to me and led me into, into understanding that relationship better and, and understanding my relationship to conservation. I had another comment in the chat. I appreciate the district and the opportunity to hunt in the area. This is great. Thanks, Gabe, for the invitation. I'll be sharing this with my friends that hunt and heavily involved in youth sports with both boys and girls and would be willing to volunteer to help with exposure of hunting to the youth. And that's the last one that I have in the chat for the moment. But does anybody have other questions? You're welcome to unmute and ask. Well, if not, I want to I want to truly thank everyone for tuning in today. Um, it was a it's a challenging presentation to put together, but I learned my choice of topics is always can I learn something by 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 doing that topic, and this was something I I learned a great deal doing it. I've learned something from you today, and in, in listening to your questions and comments. So thank you for coming today. And I hope to see you at a future Tom talk, if not before. Um, thank you. We'll be posting the video of this afterwards. So thank you very much. Have a great day.